In this video, I'll show you my approach to organizing dependency injection code in my .NET applications. I'll also discuss some libraries that I use from time to time to simplify my DI code and what are the benefits and drawbacks of all of these approaches. So if you have a typical .NET application, your dependency injection code will definitely grow over time, and if you're not paying attention, it might end up looking something like this. All of the DI code is in the program file. There is some cohesion in terms of how the code is structured, meaning the related stuff is placed closer together. But other than that, this is currently a relatively decent pile of mess with a tendency to become an even bigger pile of mess if we don't stop doing this. So obviously the best way to solve this is by creating a region that you call dependency injection, let's say setup, and then you just close the region here by saying end region and there you have it. Now all of your DI code is nicely encapsulated inside of this region and you don't have to worry about this again. Okay, I'm obviously joking. If you're using regions, please stop doing that. I don't see a good use case other than in some code generated scenarios, but let's discuss what are some options that we have when it comes to structuring our DI code. So my preferred way of solving this is having some extension methods on the iService collection interface that allow me to encapsulate my DI code. So let me give you a simple example of that. I'll add a new class inside of my file. Let's just for simplicity's sake call it dependency injection. I'll make this a static class and inside of it we want to define some extension methods. So what are some services that I may want to encapsulate here? So for example, I have some code related to adding problem details and some exception handlers. So I could create an extension method that returns an I service collection. Let's call it add exception handling. I have to make this an extension on the I service collection, let's say services. And now I can just return those services and inside of this method, I'll register the code that I need. So I want to move this code into here and we want to replace builder services with just services. And now if I update this, this code should now compile and I've managed to move a couple of lines of code into an extension method, but I still need to call it here by saying add exception handling. And then you can continue using this approach for the remaining DI code that you have. So let's try to add some structure here. I'll add one more extension method. So I'll say public static I service collection. I'll call this one add persistence. I will again make it an extension method on the I service collection type. And inside of here, I'll move the code for adding the database context. Let's extract that. However, this requires access to my connection string. So there's two ways how you could approach this. One is passing in an I configuration instance and letting this code figure out how it wants to extract the configuration value. So that's one approach. Let's say we use that. Or we could specify the argument explicitly like a connection string and extract it in the calling code. So here I'll say builder services add persistence and I need to pass in builder configuration so that we can extract the connection string. Then let's create one more extension method. I'll say public static I service collection add API services. And here I'll just jumble together a bunch of services that are related to setting up ASP.NET Core. So here I want to move code like adding the endpoints API Explorer, Swagger Gen with off. We could also jumble in the HTTP context accessor here. Let's also adding the validators, for example. And I want to make sure that I don't forget to call this. So I'll say builder services add API services. And let's say I also want to move in my Fluent email and SMTP setup. Let's do that. Although this could be its own extension method, but let's update this so that it compiles. I'll make sure to access the service collection here and update this code. And I'm still missing the configuration element here. So I need to make sure that this is specified using I configuration. So now I can update this code to access the configuration values directly. And from the calling code, I will need to specify builder configuration so that this compiles. Then we can take the authorization and authentication code and move that into its own method. I'll say public static iService collection. I'm going to call it add authentication and 
authorization. Let's make it an extension method. And inside of it, I'll just drop in the code that I had earlier. And this again depends on accessing my configuration. So I'll add a configuration parameter and let's access it here when we are configuring these settings. So from my code, I'll say builder services, add authentication and authorization, pass in builder configuration, and this should compile. I'll get rid of this call to add HTTP context accessor as it's a duplicate. And I'm left with a bunch of service registrations here, which I want to tackle next in just a moment. One more thing I want to demo is what do you do with something like OpenTelemetry? Here you can see I'm adding some services on the logging builder. This is specifically telemetry about logging. And then we have OpenTelemetry to configure tracing and possibly metrics. However, these use a different type. This is an iService collection and this is a logging builder. However, the underlying type is a web application builder. So what you could do is justify an extension method on that. You can say public static web application builder let's say add open telemetry and then make an extension method on the web application builder i'll call the argument the builder and now i should be able to just take all of this code extract it from my program file drop it in here and it should work and now i can just return the builder of course i need to remember to call this and this time we're calling add open telemetry on the builder instance so this might be something you like or don't i'll leave it up to you but for me it makes sense to keep this configuration together even though it's working on a different base type the login builder and the iService collection and now this is what we have in the dependency injection class it's a little over 100 lines of code which we managed to pull out of the program file so now it's looking a bit cleaner i can get rid of these unused using statements and what i'm left with is mostly my application services so this right here is my use cases if i take a look at register user for example you can see this is a class with a request object inside a handle method and it also contains an endpoint registration. For the endpoints themselves, I do have some boilerplate that allows me to scan my assembly, find any implementations of I endpoint, and then add them as services. And I have an extension on the web application type. It's going to resolve these services from dependency injection and call map endpoint to register them as minimal API endpoints. So if I go into register user, here's the endpoint implementation. And all it does is call map post or the respective map get, map delete, map put, or map patch to define an API endpoint with a respective HTTP method. And this is actually the direction I want to take when it comes to my application services, like the use cases here. So there's a useful library that you may or may not have heard of. It's called Scruder, and it contains some extension methods that improve what you can do with dependency injection in .NET. So I'm going to install it, and then let me show you what we can do. So Scruder has two main features. The first one is assembly scanning, and the other one is service decoration. I'll demonstrate how you can use both but with assembly scanning you can say builder services scan and then define your action is going to define how you want to register the types that you extract in the scan so i'll say scan from assemblies and then we can specify the assembly that contains our types that we want to register i'll say type of program to access this assembly. And now I want to add some types. I can say, for example, add classes. I can say if this should target public only classes or also target internal ones. Let's say I want to use public only false. You can also configure some filters here. For example, I can pass in an argument, which is going to be an expression where I can check anything on this type. So let's say T and I just have to return a Boolean expression using this type. So I can, for example, say if the type name ends with some value like repository, then do some something with these types. This approach might be useful if you have a dedicated naming convention for your types. However, it does rely on a bit of hard coding. So let's say I want to take care of all of these use cases which I have here and somehow register them automatically as scoped services. So what I could do is define some sort of abstraction. Let's add a new interface, which I'm going to call I use case. And that's everything I want to have inside. So I'm going to make this a marker interface. And the idea is you just implement this interface with your use case. And what this allows me to do is to now target this type inside of my filter. So I can say T is assignable to, and I'll say type of I use case. So now I've selected my types. Then I need to specify how I want to register this. 
I can implement this as, for example, any implemented interfaces. I can implement it as a matching interface. An example of this would be a calendar sync service type, which implements a matching interface called iCalendar sync service. Or in our case, we just want to register this service as itself and we specify which lifetime. In our case, the scoped lifetime. So I have here one, two, three, four, five, six, seven lines of code. And with seven lines of code, I can get rid of all of this code with the provision that I have to update all of my use cases to implement a use case. But if you adopt this convention, then you can somewhat simplify your dependency injection code. Now, what are the pros and cons of using this approach? Well, the benefit is obviously having to write less code when it comes to dependency injection setup. If I want to now define a new feature, I just define a new class, let's say internal sealed class. I'm going to call it ban user. And then I can just implement a use case here, define my logic inside, define my endpoint, and that's it. I have a new feature exposed from my API without having to touch a single line of dependency injection code because it's all handled automatically. And in this case, I'm using Scrooter. Now, when it comes to the drawbacks, this uses reflection. So it's not compatible with native AOT. Now, there are some concerns when it comes to performance, but in my opinion, this is completely negligible because the only time this code is going to execute is once when you start your application. This already runs on the CPU and it's going to be incredibly fast. So without using reflection, you're shaving off a couple of nanoseconds, which is pretty much irrelevant for most modern applications. Now, granted, there are going to be some applications that require this level of performance. So in that case, go ahead and make all of the optimizations that are required. That is completely legitimate and understandable. But for the majority of use cases, doing something like this is going to be perfectly fine. One more drawback that I have to highlight is that using assembly scanning like this for dependency injection setup does make it less clear what are all of the services that you're registering with DI. Nonetheless, many popular libraries use this approach. They may not exactly use Cruder, but they definitely use assembly scanning. For example, Mediator does assembly scanning when it's setting up the request handlers. And I'm sure many other libraries, including some in the framework itself, are doing assembly scanning without you even being aware of it. Next, when it comes to these services here, we have a couple of options. We could try to match these types based on their name. So in this case, if a type name ends with service, then we can register them as scoped or any other lifetime. We could also have respective marker interfaces that are going to specify which lifetime we should use. For example, iTransient, iScoped, or iSingleton. And for services that don't have an interface, like the meeting policy service or these three here, we can also check if they have any implemented interfaces. And if not, we can just register them as self, like we did with our use cases. So I'm going to leave that as an exercise for you. Now, one more thing I want to show you is how you can do service registration with Scrooter. So I'll use my calendar sync service. And let's say I just want to add some logging. I'll create a new implementation of the logging calendar sync service. And inside of here, I can inject the iCalendar sync service. And this is going to be the base implementation, which I'm decorating. And what you essentially do is you call the base implementation and just pass in the meeting. And now before or after this call, you can add your decorated logic. So for example, I can inject an iLogger of logging calendar sync service. Let's call this the logger. And I can use this logger to add some information logs. So I'll say logger log info. And in the message, I'll say syncing meeting We'll specify meeting ID as the argument and we'll pass that from the meeting instance. Now, how you wire this up with Scrooter is when you register your service, you can say builder services decorate and you specify the iCalendar sync service and then the decorator, which is going to be logging calendar sync service. And other than this, you don't have to do any additional work. Now, what happens when you inject iCalendar sync service is you get an instance of the logging calendar calendar sync service, which internally contains the baseline implementation of the calendar sync service. So when you end up calling the method exposed on this interface, which is, if I recall, sync meeting to external calendars, you're first going to call the decorated implementation, and then you're going to call the baseline implementation. So this is how you can start stacking decorated behavior with Scrooter. So let me add this call here, and hopefully this should illustrate how this works. You can keep stacking as many of these decorators as you want, or as you need. However, try not to overdo it. Some common use cases for this that I've used is having a logging decorator, having a caching decorator, and you can have some decorators that can extend the behavior based on if a feature flag is turned on or off, the possibility
possibilities here are pretty endless. So there you have it. That's my approach to dependency injection. Now I would definitely recommend using the first part. Organize your DI code inside of nicely named extension methods to make it easier to figure out what is where. When it comes to using something like Scrooter for automatically registering your services, I suggest you weigh the pros and cons and figure out if it makes sense to use this in your use case. So we talked about dependency injection setup in this video, but if you want to see how I set up a new .NET project with all of the best practices from scratch, then I recommend that you watch this video next. Make sure to smash the like button for the YouTube algorithm so this video gets shown to more .NET developers. Check out my courses if you want to improve your software architecture skills. And until next time, stay awesome.